You are listening to the Battle Ready Podcast. My name is Aaron McManus, and today we have something special. We went into the archives and found an episode that is dear to my heart called Have Father Will Travel. My sister Mariah McManus, my dad, and I all sit down and have a conversation, reminisce on the past, talk about the future, and break down a few family ideas. If you've never seen this episode, I suggest watching it. And maybe you've seen it and it's been a while. Uh, check it out again. But I really think this is a great post Father's Day tribute. Oh, and before you go, we have new merch that we've just released. So you can go to battlereadypodcast.com or go to the Instagram, hit the link in the bio, and check out the new merch. It's starting to ship this week. So that's really exciting. Uh, check it out. It's new, it's released. It's out there. See you guys soon. You have such a great radio voice. Oh, thank you. I've been practicing. It's very soothing. <laughs> That's so good. I've never heard you talk like that before. Really? <laughs> I just want you to talk like that at home. I know. Right? That's just so good. Would you get less mad at me, you think? I don't know. Well, I just got to <laughs> say, not. I love having both my kids here. Or, we're going to yeah. we're gonna literally spin the whole time. <laughs> Why did they give us these chairs? We did, we did invite your mom. Yeah, uh, but she's busy preparing for Mosaic College, and so yes. she was unavailable. And we were hoping, uh, and we hope one day we'll get Jake, your husband, uh, with us. Yes, I was the only person who who said yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, so in other words, we were uh, stood up by two. I'm <laughs> it. By two different people. But but, uh, but we're so glad to have you, Mariah, because you were oh, our first choice. Yeah. Yes, sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and we're doing this special podcast because uh, this, um, well, today. Today is my birthday. Today is Happy your birthday. birthday. It's August 28th, and um, I couldn't think of a better, more enjoyable thing to um, do on my birthday than to have a podcast with my two favorite people. So happy birthday. Which one's your more, mo, more favorite? I yeah. knew you Most favorite. <laughs> Most favorite. <laughs> well, I'm still waiting to see what kind of gifts I receive. So, um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, uh, okay. I'll okay. let you know afterwards. <laughs> well, happy birthday. We Thank love you so, so much. very much. Oh, Thank you, and uh, you guys definitely uh, made my life more interesting. And <laughs> <laughs> we're definitely Not really a compliment or an insult, it's kind of a, a thing. <laughs> and you've, but you've definitely kept me younger and made me older. Both. <laughs> <laughs> We've aged you quite well. Yes. Oh yes. my goodness! We just thought it'd be really fun to uh, have a conversation about our family, maybe tell a few stories. And Mariah keeps asking, "What exactly is this podcast about?" And we didn't really have an answer. We just said, um, just trust us. <laughs> trust us. We'll tell some stories. We'll have some conversations and we'll get into it. All right. <laughs> and, uh, so maybe we should take a few moments and just tell wonderful stories about me. Oh, we could. <laughs> we or could <laughs> we could talk about how he's an oppressive vacation goer. <laughs> yeah, we didn't go on vacations probably until like how many years ago was our first vacation. Okay, wait, wait, wait. I didn't Four know there was going to be a ago. therapeutic session no, 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 about my parenting I deficiencies. <laughs> <laughs> we probably didn't go on a vacation until like four years ago for the first time. First vacation four years ago, first time, yeah. I mean, right. like you have to understand, we grew up pastor's kids, so our version of a vacation was going to a beach city that you were speaking at a conference at, and <laughs> you were like, this is vacation, but then you disappear for a few hours yeah. a day and go and speak, which, you know, looking back, it was awesome. It's awesome. But it wasn't much of a vacation for you. It's true. I think for probably 25 years, I um, I might have been a little bit negligent in the vacation category, <laughs> and, uh, and and there are different reasons for that. Uh, I think in the early phases. Yeah, let us know. <laughs> yeah, tell us the yeah. reasons, That's, please. What's up? I'm uh, I'm a compulsive workaholic. Yes. <laughs> your 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 thought process would be: Why would I go and pay to do nothing? Yes, that's exactly why. What a horrible <laughs> thing to do! <laughs> wait, 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 wait. But I called Mariah this morning, and and I and I was like, I'm so glad you're doing that already, and because we we had talked about it before, but it ended up being this was the right time, and then you were super gracious because you just got back in town. You were on a writing retreat, writing for MSC. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I mean, was it a vacation? No. <laughs> we went to this beautiful place, and it was so nice. And the first few days were like more than we could have expected you know it's like you feel like royalty and then a hurricane hit a, a stage four <laughs> hurricane hit right or a class yeah, four. yeah it it got classified as different numbers throughout the day but <laughs> all i know was that after the hurricane hit we had no water no power no ac 
No Wi-Fi. No Wi-Fi. And you 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 call you text me and called me and said, "Hey, there's a hurricane coming. Should we stay? Should we leave?" And yeah, and Wait, I said she calls us during the filming of a Battle, of Battle Ready. Ready. That's right. That's right. Yeah, and uh, so we ended up having a conversation with you on air, and then I told you to stay. It's just uh -huh. a hurricane, and. Uh, Little did I know you would have no power, no electricity, yeah. no water. <laughs> and then it, it turned to a mission strip really, really fast. <laughs> and then I'm supposed to meet them down there. So you could have a few days so of go and enjoy some time with your sister and friends. And yeah, I was really just trying to get writing credit on the album. <laughs> and and because, the, you know, it's a, it's a pretty controversial topic between me and Mariah that I was kicked out of MSC pretty early on. I don't know the, what you're talking about. You just want people to feel now, bad for you. <laughs> <laughs> and I did. I played bass on the first tour. You're not MC. like what? very good. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Why are we going that, there? That I thought right that was you. Know, I thought we all knew that. I thought we all knew that. No one said it out loud. I thought what, you've been lying to me for 32 years. I never years lied of my life. to you. I never told you. You just you led were good. me to believe I had potential. I mean, you had. Sure, everyone has potential. Oh my gosh. We've got to start over. Well, no, go. Ahead. You're you're trying to go down. Yeah, you're trying to, to just, join okay, them. So, so basically, this, <laughs> okay, no, the, the spot, they they rented they rented distracted. a house. They rented a house. They flew everyone who who writes and works on the, right. on the team. You guys do this once a year, maybe mm -hmm. in a writing record year, mm -hmm. which is awesome. And you guys are on it. Like people don't know. Like when I explained to people what you do, one, you've been a writer, a songwriter since you were 16. Mm -hmm. Before that, but like officially paid to write music since you were 16. Yeah. You moved to Nashville, and then I kind of followed you and hung out with you for yeah. a little bit. What do you mean? We, yeah. No, I'm. I'm. You want to go into that when you called me crying, <laughs> being like, I can't do this by myself. You're self-conscious. I'm saying yes, we did that together. <laughs> yeah, well, I had a fond memory of it. Why are oh you my upset? Goodness. Okay, get back you're to really, you. You're trying to meet them, yeah. and you're I'm on really plane. upset about this. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just okay. I mean, it is what I, I, mean, I didn't mean you for meant you to so have much of that. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't mean for you to have that reaction. I didn't realize this was gonna end up being turned on me. No, I'm saying Nashville was a great memory. Keep going. Okay, so you're on a plane, trying Wait. to get to them, so you can get writing credit. Come so I, so I'm flying, so I'm flying down, I'm flying down to go to go join them for a couple of days, which was awesome. And we sent some of the like some of our, our team to kind of document and film because we're gonna release some really cool like mm -hmm. MSC videos at some point. And then Jake uh, the flew at the same time, but on a same different time. plane. Yes. We, me and Jake end up being at LAX flying. But his flight got canceled, so he bought another flight that ended oh, up. I didn't know that. His flight yeah. got canceled in the morning, so he ended up just getting on another flight. That was at the same time as yours. So it ends up being different airlines. He arrives two minutes before I'm supposed to land. All of a sudden, mid-flight, or I guess not mid-flight, towards the end of our flight, they're saying, hey, you know, they do all the, the normalities. You know, lift your seat up, put everything in the stowaways, get ready. We're about to descend into our, to our landing. And then all of a sudden, we, like, out of nowhere, the plane just starts just jetting upwards, like, straight up. That's like, I'm, crazy. like, if there was, if I was standing up, I would have been sideways. It was going straight up, straight up, straight up. And, <laughs> and I'm texting with Jake because I still had Wi-Fi. Like, did you land? And I get a text from um, one of the, the band people who, like, came to pick us up, Amy Davidson, from the airport. And she's like, hey, guys, like, I'm here. Um, you guys good? Jake's like, yeah, I landed. I'm like, I, something just happened. But it took Jake twice to land, I think. He, he, he yes. they tried to land and then they shot back up into the sky and we're like, we can't land. And if we don't, like, we'll try again. And if we don't make it, we'll go home. Go home. So his pilot landed the second time. Yes. So my pilot said, no, I'm good. <laughs> nah. And this is how I know Jake was in the plane in front of us because they, he says the plane in front of us had to try twice. I don't think it's safe. We're going back to LA. And in that moment, my heart broke. I was sad. And I just, I just went back to LA. So I literally spent four and a half hours on the plane, get back for to LA. Nothing, for that, literally nothing. That's the worst so you took an feeling. international trip without actually ever landing anywhere. <laughs> yeah. I didn't Did go you have anywhere. to go through customs? No, they laughed on the on the on <laughs> yeah, the, on like, the, on the overhead. So annoying. <laughs> hey, so you don't have to go through customs at least because we didn't land anywhere. And I was just, I was like, well, and it, it was an interesting day. Interesting I'm day. Sorry. So, anyways. What was the moral of the story? I don't know if we have any morality no, to this no. story, but yeah, it was just I was trying to see you, and then I couldn't get there. Well, here we are. Here we are. But you had a few days where, well, by the way, so the moral of the story is you really didn't want to land <laughs> because you would have had five days without water yes. or electricity yes. or yes. or any of the, um, well, the niceties uh, we're accustomed to in amenities, the amenities, amenities of in, life in LA. Right. So back to no vacations. Yes. Well, what we were saying about the no vacations thing was that 
you spent however many years of our lives depriving us of vacationing. And this past year when we went to vacation, we were on a very rigid schedule of sports <laughs> and <laughs> we've realized. activities and waking up at 7 a.m. and playing tennis so, and then going and then playing tennis again and then going to an, sleep. An oppressive vacationer. I was what we've learned about you maximizing is, our vacation experience. What we've learned about you is that <laughs> <laughs> one, Mariah is being sarcastic. If, if you hear and she's like, you know, we've never got taken on vacations, you know, you deprived, like she's joking, obviously. But now that we're adults and we decide to go on vacation together, it's kind of a fun family thing. Mm -hmm. We all go once a year. Do we go in the sun on the beach? But in four years, my dad has turned into like, let's go take some time to ourselves to a rigid a rigid, oppressive vacation father you've become, who schedules out the whole day. You've become more competitive every minute you've been alive. Every and minute. And now, how old are you turning? Well, 62 is uh, the new um, the new birthday. You look incredible for 62, can we just say? What's no, your secret? You. What is your secret? <laughs> what do you use to exfoliate? <laughs> Brutal vacations. <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> hours and hours of paddle okay. tennis. I want to give context because... When Kim and I were married, we were um, we were really poor. Yeah, we were so and, broke. And you were so, so broke. I mean, our first year, we we slept on the floor because we couldn't afford a bed. No mattress. And uh, I would say for the first 10 years of my adult um, income earning era, I never made more than $15,000 a year. So What changed? Uh, what was the thing that changed? Well, I mean, so many different things uh, along the way, but but I would the reason I'm saying that is, no, I think I I, I we, we I grew up in this environment where we didn't have a lot of extra money, a lot of discretionary money. So the only way I could take you guys quote a vacation was as I became um, more, I guess, well known as a speaker, or more there was more demand for author. me to and as yeah. an author, and so people would invite me to come, and they'd offer to pay me a certain amount of money, and I would say. Hey, you don't have to pay me money. Just fly me and my family together, or fly me and Aaron, or fly me and Mariah, or fly. And so yeah. the way I would be compensated is getting to take you around the world. And yeah. um, I would always come back broke, but we had these <laughs> incredible experiences. And so probably until you guys were 15 years old, I would say that Mariah, you've been to over 30 countries around the world. Uh, she's probably been to debt more than that. Maybe 40 Maybe or 50? 40 plus, 50 plus, yeah. And you're pretty close to the same? I'm, I'm Yeah, I'm like in the 40s now. Because when you started really going in, you, I mean, my first trip mm -hmm. to Tokyo, <laughs> I think. I, I took I you to, seven, you went to Bangkok six? and then Hong Kong. No, no, but my you, first, first trip was to Tokyo. It was to Tokyo, yeah. And I almost got lost on the speed train. You did, you, well, you actually, didn't you go one more exit? I did. You yeah. had to meet me at the exit. Yeah, yeah, because you have to run away. If you, <laughs> I lost you in Tokyo. I should write a book. You really should <laughs> I write a book. I should write the book. <laughs> Got lost in Tokyo. Yes, and we, but we, uh, we actually had all these strategies of what happened if I lose you in a city. Yeah. What happens if you, if we get separated? What happens? And so you learn how to survive in different places in the world. And you, and you always told me go back to the last place we were. Yeah, and we would both go back to the last place we remember seeing each other, and that's how we would always, and that really came through many times for both of us. Yes, in the Shibuya all of us. station. <laughs> yeah. So I will say, even though we didn't quote vacation, you experienced the world in a way that very few people in, nope. in the world have ever experienced Definitely. it. And, and, and we, 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 we say the no vacation thing is mostly joking and being sarcastic, but it really, we, you did more than just take us on vacations. You really showed us how to adventure and how to yeah. explore the world. For sure. And I remember, too, like, so much of those trips was sitting, like, looking back at it, I was talking about this the other day, sitting in meetings, which I honestly, maybe at the time, wasn't, like, super really, yeah, about. super <laughs> grateful for. Wait, I have a story about that, so you go first. <laughs> but that was so much of, I think, where we learned what we learned of who you are and how you function and how you think and how to think was because we were sitting in meetings with you and you were you never underestimated our ability to think even at you know six seven eight years old you always thought okay they should be in the room because this is yeah i always thought of you as um small humans <laughs> yeah you you really never you, yeah, you never treated us like children no, you always no. kind of expected 
and I mean this in like the best way. You always kind of expected us to just be able to walk into any room and be able to take care of ourselves. Mm-hmm. I remember in kindergarten when when you're going one, I want you to tell the story of the first trip we actually went on together internationally. It was supposed to be Tel Salvador. Yeah, I didn't go on that <laughs> trip. You didn't go on that trip. <laughs> what but, but, but before we he should tell that, that story. You really should tell that story because you that was the first arrested. international trip because you're a Salvadorian. You're from a Salvador. And I wanted to take you both to my country. And to I want, see your grandparents. I wanted you to meet. My... And he had gone on many trips at that no, point. No, no, no. The only trip before that was, was Tokyo. Yeah. And no. Yeah. Uh, no, you no, had you, gone. You, you'd been on a few other trips. A few other me. ones? Maybe okay. not yeah. international. Because I remember I took you to Bangkok and then to Hang- Hong Kong. Remember when you yes. jumped on that bed that was car- that was made out of yes. wood? <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I almost killed you, and I, I tried to stop you. You didn't know that we were sleeping on wooden floors. Yeah, yeah, so bad. <laughs> and, uh, on wooden uh, beds, yeah. Beds. So With sheets I wanted to take guys to El Salvador. I wanted you to meet my grandparents. I wanted you to go to the house that I grew up in. I wanted you to sleep in the bedroom I I, uh, I grew up in. I want You would be sleeping in the same bed I slept in and yeah. walked to the same park. And and it's just so cool. And, and and both of you, I don't know why, but you were both born blonde. Like, right. like, like so like, like you sweet Mormon blonde. Norwegian like sweet, or Norwegian yes. or something Norwegian. like that. Like bright and, blonde, blue eyed. Yeah, well, and at least you have brown eyes, Aaron. But Mariah, you have yeah, these true. these green <laughs> we don't know where they color came eyes. And well, I do know where they came from, thank you. <laughs> and uh, but they came um, from your grandfather. Or had, or right. your mom. Yeah. And yeah, my, both my family and, and her family have green and blue eyes in them. And but anyway, so you're this blonde headed, green eyed little girl. And Aaron's this blonde-headed kid, and I take you to the terminal, and all of a sudden, the Mariah International just, Terminal and, at LAX. Yeah, going to El Salvador. Going to El Salvador. And I had maybe longer hair. and You I, had a mullet and a beard. And I looked much more international. You looked <laughs> like you were from, you looked, you honestly looked, you looked very Syrian back then. More Middle Eastern. You looked yes. like you could have been a drug dealer. I can't help it, it, it that I look that way. But uh, anyway, Mariah starts <laughs> screaming bloody murder. Okay, I don't, but this no. is, no, no, no. I feel like I need to defend my younger self here. <laughs> <laughs> because I'd never been on a trip. No, but you also had never really been away from your mom. No. Never, no. And I was, I'm four years younger than Aaron. So I was so much th- younger. Three and a half. Three and a half. Okay. Three and a half, four years old. <laughs> No, no, how old no you? I would have five, been like, five yeah, five or six. And this right. is the first yeah. time I've okay. ever been away from my mom or my right. sister. So I'm not, and there's no, it's just you, Aaron, and David Arcos, right? David yeah, Arcos, so yeah. you start screaming, screaming, I don't <laughs> want to go, I don't want to go, I like want my not, mommy, like, I want no. my mommy. No, I'm like talking about, screaming. I'm talking like, Stephen King level screaming, <laughs> yes. okay? blood curling, <laughs> terrifying. Terrifying. And, and everyone's looking at me, the customs officials, you know, immigration is looking at me. And this is a huge terminal, and this thing is echoing down the entire And it terminal. looks like I'm kidnapping these two children. Yes. <laughs> With so, your with your with your right hand man, David Arthur, right, grabbing yeah, yeah. me, being like, "We're good, me we're good, yeah, we're yeah, good, yeah. we're good, my son." So I panic and I tell David, "Hold on, to Aaron, the plane's about to board." I grab you, Mariah, and I start running down this international terminal, trying to get back to security before Kim disappears. And I'm yelling, "Kim, she's on the other side of security." And, and I'm able to convince security to let you go back to your mom. So that was your first attempt at international travel. You stayed behind, and Aaron got to go to El Salvador and and have that experience. Which, and, looking back at that trip and how suspect, it, El Salvador, El Salvador at the time and oftentimes there were a few depending moments. on who's in government. Yes. The president now is incredible. Mm-hmm. He's doing massive, bringing massive change. It was so sketchy. Well, there, there we ended up going again. Later. Later. No, just I, a few years later. But I'm going to add something here because so that began a series of trips where you said no. So the way I would do this when I was traveling internationally, I would offer you a trip, Aaron, and I'll offer you a trip, Mariah. I said, mm-hmm. this is Aaron's trip. This is Mariah's trip. Aaron would say yes every time. You would say no every time. So Aaron would get your trips. And so for several years, Aaron got every single trip. I was living a, a, a lavish <laughs> life of travel. <laughs> So he had been to like modern 20 countries and Mariah eight. had been to zero. And then one day the light came on in Mariah. And it ruined and I said, my Mariah, life. I said, Mariah, this is your turn. Do you want to go? And, and then you said no. And then Aaron lit up. And then Mariah Cha-ching. goes, wait a minute. I get to go on this amazing trip. <laughs> and Mariah goes, wait a minute. Every time I say no, he gets my trip. <laughs> and he, she goes, no. He goes, I'm going to go. And Aaron's like, what? What? <laughs> <laughs> he was just so disappointed. No. And he knew his life was changing in that moment. And I was so happy that you had this breakthrough 
And after that, it was a solid decade before I went on another like. Well, it was only right that Mariah got to have most of the trips from that point I forward. Had to make up for lost time. We, she had to make up for lost time, and I was so happy she wanted to travel, <laughs> and she got to see it the was world. A dark era. And so there was a period of time where she had been to far more countries than like, you. Like double, triple the amount of countries. Because you just started at this point, you have written a couple of books. You're speaking all over the world. You were going to Europe. You're going to Asia. You're just popping around these different countries. And I was, where was I? In the the in little Whittier. suburb in Whittier, California. <laughs> <laughs> Google that. But so going back to the thing, yes, I never understood vacations because, first of all, because I didn't grow up with wealth. I didn't really have that that mindset of you just take a week and go do nothing and pay a lot of money to do nothing. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, we were experiencing the world and I found that I was able to do something that allowed us to see the world and experience life. And I thought this was the best combination of things. And it always felt like a vacation for me being with you guys. And That's sweet. I'm sure it wasn't. I'm sure it didn't feel like <laughs> I that. was working like a dog. <laughs> you would work so hard. You, I know. you really do work really hard. And, but, uh, but I, I felt like I was living a dream and I wanted you guys to be a part of that. And I wanted to put that, that value in your life, that the world is big to experience all of humanity, yeah. to see the beauty of the diversity and the planet. And because of that, you two are very different. You're, you're, you're global people, right? You see the world from such a broader perspective. I think it affects your writing, Mariah, and the way that you see the world, it affects Aaron, uh, even the way that you want to uh, affect this podcast, even the way you think about battle writing, the subjects we're going to talk about, the way you guys see politics and culture, it's all affected by being touched by the world. And uh, and um, I, I, if I could share this, I remember one time that you had a little period of time, you're probably eight, nine years old, and Mariah, and and you started really like loving things a lot. And mm -hmm. so we uh, took it to Indonesia, and there was a lot of poverty there. And all of a sudden, because these children just were drawn to you, you were like a little light and just dozens upon dozens upon dozens of children just started surrounding you, overwhelming you. And someone said, I'll grab her. I said, no. I said, this is why we brought her to be in the middle of this. And you were never the same again. Like there was an entire layer of texture in your soul of compassion and empathy and generosity that we watched almost just like seep mm -hmm. into you and, and come out of you. And, and so I'm really grateful for those opportunities. And then the funny thing, of course, is there was a certain point where I wanted to go see a part of the world and I got in this terrible invitation. And, and I said, well, maybe I should take the invitation so I could go see that part of the world. And my, um, my executive assistant said, uh, you could actually afford to go there all by yourself now. <laughs> and I said, what? And she said, she goes, I don't think you realize that you could actually afford like to take a vacation. Hmm. And, and I remember when she told me that it was, uh, Lisa, I, I actually didn't have in my mindset that I, I could afford to take a vacation. Mm -hmm. I was told the guy keeping this, this shampoo and conditioner from the hotels. Oh my gosh. You do, so do you do that? Yes, I do. I still do it. It's a like compulsive now. Yeah, I'm dad like, would just say like, take all the, take all the little the little shampoo. <laughs> you come <laughs> home with thirty <laughs> shampoos and these things. I wouldn't. I, I would. I would use the first days and then and then save them and and every day when they would replace them, I would save them to come home because that's how we would have shampoo. And conditioner. But you still have a drawer full of hotel a shampoo. Drawer. I, there are some things that are hard to break. Some things are hard to break. You. <laughs> but I do think, like, uh, as we're looking back, and I think people may see us now and think, "Wow, either they're all really successful, or you know." You're very generous, and and which you both it's both. You're very successful, and and I live by your generosity. <laughs> and, <laughs> and but but I say that because I because I think oftentimes oftentimes when I'm telling people like you know the intro to your life like who are you as a person or who am I as a person I'm I, they see kind of the life that we live and 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 the opportunities that we have and now in the in the position that we may have in. in of whether it, whether it's our, our church or, or or the speaking world or the music world or the podcast world, whatever it may be, and it was such a far journey, and I think we look back and 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 we you really built something for yourself and for us and for other people and and to think that that you came from and I, I don't want to say you came from nothing you came from so much, mm -hmm. but it was all raw and it was unharnessed and it was potential and it was. 
it was this this mixing pot of cultures and religions and and conversations and and parents and step parents and and then to and even nationalities and and coming from El Salvador, Miami to living in North Carolina to back to to Texas to LA and and being this pioneer and never being afraid of the next five years, the next ten years, and never being afraid of of what it was. You were just such such an adventurer, which I think made me become a compulsively fearful person at times because <laughs> you were never afraid of anything. And but I, but I remember being in, I mean, being in Thailand, being in Tokyo, being in El Salvador, having l- like moments where, I mean, we could have lost our lives. We could have died. And Mariah we, almost did in Bangkok. Yeah, and she ran across the street and got hit hit on by a car. And I want to. You want to talk about that one? Not really. Well, <laughs> to this day, I have guilt because the one thing my dad said when we left the hotel is, "Your one responsibility is to look after your sister." I'm like twelve. I'm years, still telling you the same. I'm thing. twelve years old right now. He <laughs> tells me that now. And all of a sudden, Mariah runs across the street. Given it was like complicated bangkok is super hectic it's yeah. the night market it's crazy it, it should have she should have been able to run across the street it was a it was a, a crosswalk there are people as close to me as you are in front of me yeah. and and behind yeah and and so she was running from like one group of friends that we were with to another group of friends really a span of 10 feet and a car runs the, the, red, light, the, yeah. the red light and tries to make a, a turn and i see my little sister flying like like I think across. you were 10 years old at the time. Eight. Eight? Okay. Eight years old, but you were taller than me, I think. <laughs> <laughs> That's a whole other podcast. Yeah. That's a whole That's other thing. I was underdeveloped. We talked about it in the last episode. I don't want to talk about it again. And, 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 but I, I meet people now who are so afraid of, of dying, and I'm like, man, I have almost died so many times in my life. And I've and I've watched your life and tell the stories and stories of sacrifice and stories of moments where you thought you were going to lose your life and, and and you've just it's just a different conversation of like you've lived genuinely a beautiful life, you've never really been afraid of death though you've been aware that it's close at times. Mm-hmm. How has that changed you, living, now? Like what if I remember at fifty you literally said to mom and to everyone I'm fifty I don't care what anyone thinks about me anymore I'm gonna I'm gonna just break the rules. Mm-hmm. You started a fashion company, started another business, started an app company, doing commercials, all this stuff. What's what did what happened at sixty? What are you doing now? What's the next ten years? <laughs> well, it's How funny it when people always ask. You know, I, I would say one thing: it, 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 whenever you love something or someone, it um, it creates a different kind of internal experience. Like I, I think I was fairly fearless as an adult until I married your mom and then I was afraid for her and I had to overcome that and and then I felt like I didn't really have a lot of issue with fear at all and then when you were born Aaron your first child I didn't I all of a sudden I was afraid to die and leave you fatherless mm. and then and then I got past that and then Mariah was born and I'd never had, a, you know, this experience. I mean, when Mariah was born, um, all of a sudden I felt like the weight of being alive meant something different. And, and so I, I, I think there's anyone who doesn't want to live doesn't love something. Like I want to live because I love you guys and I love your mom and, and it makes me love this life. And, and so I don't want to ever come across like someone who doesn't want to live. I, I love life and I live it fully and richly and I don't want a wasted moment. And if anything, I'm really aware of the moments I've wasted and I don't want to waste any. Mm. I want to live them fully. That's why I don't like conflict. That's why I don't like when we fight. That's why, that's why, that's why I hate when we He's waste. avoiding making eye contact oh, with yeah. me and Ryan because we, yeah. we, we fight. Yeah, I but, mean, but yeah. to me, like every day you fight, it's, fight. It's, it's a day that's it's somewhat lost to the beauty of what we were supposed to live. And, and I feel that really deeply. <laughs> it's and so emotional. I am, I'm, emotional. I am, I am, I, I admit it, I've, as I've gotten older, I'm a, I'm a poet and, uh, and uh, a philosopher poet. And, and that's who I am and I'm okay with that. Um, there's so much I want to accomplish for the next decade of my life. Like what? Like I'm not any, I don't always like to say. Say it, say it, and, speak it, uh, speak into the universe. You never know who's going to hear it. <laughs> there, um, well, I, I, I feel like now I start thinking in terms of what are the things I want to leave behind that can affect the world for generations to come. 
and and those are some things you know and so there's there's a, a spectrum of things you know i've been working on a graphic novel for two years i'd really like to get it done it's really good and really uh good. and developed and and i hope that that graphic novel is the beginning of, of several graphic novels that i can create over the years i i um i still have a real longing to create more art i still i still dream about creating films and going back and and expressing like beauty and fashion and i can't shake those things they're always inside of me i just mm -hmm. always think about them all the time i do have more books i want to write um but in a lot of ways i want to leave a way of thinking and um behind i know that sounds crazy but mm -hmm. it's not so much what i think that i want to leave behind it's it's a process it's a way of thinking it's i hope to leave think. behind yeah and so i'm hoping i can do that and, and spend some time over the next few years leaving that to the world if i can you're not going anywhere anytime, anytime soon so oh, we, don't, we don't have to we don't have to go that route but i but i do think it's really interesting and, and kind of an uh unique perspective into your life and how you kind of have achieved what you've achieved and and i don't know I also one more thing at sixty two. I I really want to develop a step back three, a step back three, because you just watched. It's, I just watched Luca beat Luca you know, oh. the Clippers, and he did that beautiful step back three. Man, I just thought you know, you always need to keep improving your game. So I need to develop this step back three point shot. Okay, and okay. so you know, I, I think it's sad when people. Ten years ago, I had friends who were my age who were telling me, "Hey, it's time for us." We're, we, it's, we're in retirement mode. We just need to be developing the next generation. And I told him, I said, hey, I'm all for developing the next generation, but I am not in retirement mode. Yeah. Like, Interesting, because those same people won't give up their organizations to younger people. Yeah, it's so ironic, you know. <laughs> and uh, so I want to, like, I want to go out on the front line. You know, I want to I want to go out the way I came in, fighting for the world. And, yeah. um, and, and I want to do it together. That is interesting, because it is the way you you perceive like organizational structure, you don't really see, like most, I think most structures are from the bottom to the top, right? The top mm -hmm. down. You really are from the front to the back. And anyone who's brave enough and willing to dedicate enough time and energy and has the, the ability can stand at the front with you, but you don't expect them, you they, you allow them to stay at the back if they want. And so you're, you're kind of that different leader where I always felt like you're always at the front line. You're never at the top. You never choose to be at the top, you always choose to be at the front. And it's a very, it's a very big difference mm -hmm. if you really look at it. Like you've always been willing to take the first step and always be willing to trust the next person. And you've never been like, there's, it's only me in the front. You've always been like, there's plenty of room for us. It's a line. It's a whole thing. It's it, be here if you're willing to dare and risk your life and, <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and jump into this. But talk to us. <laughs> talk to us. I think something that's very interesting about the way that you've chosen to to work and position your life is that it isn't the retirement goal. You know, it's not right. the, like, you never worked for money, um, even though sometimes we probably wish that you did, <laughs> that you had. <laughs> um, it just, that was part of the, the journey for you, and that was part of the blessing, and the sort of surprise, I think, to you was that anyone paid you to do something that you loved doing that, or that you felt like you had to do. Mm. And it's sort of the the crisis that I think Aaron and I have always lived in is that um, there's no job like sufficient enough for either of us because you've lived with this like burning, um, this burning mission to do what you have to do. Mm -hmm. And so it's sort of created this um, somewhat horrible crisis <laughs> that yes. I feel like we've had to live in <laughs> yes. for our whole lives of like, okay, we can't just do a job. We have to do something that we have to do. What is the thing we have to do? And it's a beautiful yeah. thing. It's a gift. I've watched you do it. It also creates total, you know, just- Inner turmoil. It's constant <laughs> inner Rising turmoil. on the inside. It is constant stormy waters inside of it both of us. It is dark and stormy inside. <laughs> <laughs> And, and a we little say bit this with a laugh. And he's so very nervous <laughs> right now. So you don't want me to do happens. a battle ready on parenting. <laughs> it was some good stuff. What? <laughs> no, there because. really was. No, but hold on. Can I, I want to ask you this question because I think there'd be some people that listen to this and maybe share it with their parents. Um, when do you plan on retiring? Well, right after I take my last breath. <laughs> yes. So, but can you walk people through why your mentality is that? Like, why would you see the world like that? You... Well, I mean, I think the reason people think about retirement is they're, they're living a life they don't want. Mm. And yeah. so you're, you're working for the day. You don't have to live the life you didn't want. Okay. 
And I, th and I, I always thought it's so dumb to put retirement at the end of your life. You should put retirement like in that sense of like enjoying the life you, you long for throughout yeah. your whole life. And so I make sure I live a life I want to live. So I don't want to retire from it. Just like the word vacation means cool. to vacate. But I'm like, I, I didn't want to vacate my life. I yeah. was creating a life I wanted to be in all the time. You just found, and I, and I was, and I would, I know this because mm -hmm. maybe 10 years growing up in the church with you as the pastor, becoming the pastor, pretty tumultuous. Yeah. And it, it was not, so like, this is the connection I'm making to the, the people who'd watch this and go like, I'm just a faithful worker yeah. who provides for my family day in and day out. Or that's awesome. whether you're a husband or yeah. a wife or a single mom or single dad, someone who just works that job. That's like, it's a grind. It's tough. It sucks. It's not sexy it's not necessarily fun it's not necessarily joyful you now being a pastor this day and age is kind of like a cool job but it you wasn't to, but it wasn't <laughs> yeah oh yeah let and, me really and not clear. only yeah. that like yeah. you worked with and you know respect to the people who stuck with you but you worked with some pretty tough people in a pretty tumultuous situation in the ghetto none of that was glamorous yeah yeah i want to be clear the pastoring side of it has always been the work side <laughs> yeah Right. And it was, um, it's rarely been the easy part of my life or the part of my life that brought the most intrinsic um, reward. Like, how did you differentiate that? How did you make, how did you make something that was really hard, really fun? How did you find the joy in the mundane? I mean, there were years that was pretty tough. I mean, for five years, I had a twitch in my right eye from the stress I was carrying from yeah. pastoring. Uh, I'm not really designed the way I see most pastors who do this well they don't seem to really be affected by all the negativity and all the antagonism. And I'm, they are, they are, they are, they just, they're there. I think we still live in a, in a place where you can't lead people if you're on honest and vulnerable and yeah. going through stuff. But I, I so do they think are, they the, just haven't, one of, the, one of the great things about right now is like, it's actually very like cool to be a pastor right right now yeah. is like, you know, it, except for like, dating but it's fine keep going okay no that's a different podcast <laughs> but it's good to know that you're even thinking about dating that, yeah i thought and, about uh, it we're for I, that i declined <laughs> and, uh, no yeah. but what i want to say is like passion was really hard it was hard work and for years it was the heaviest darkest aspect of my life mm -hmm. uh you guys were the joy of my life hmm. and being with you parenting you raising you gave me like that oxygen of going there's my life is really good so no matter how bad it was on another end being your dad is what made my life worth living mm. and and i'll say that without any any hesitation and so i think that that's the thing is that when other people necessarily were not very kind i had two kids what mattered to me was did you love me did you respect me mm -hmm. and if it, that for me was important because you know there are people who don't know you who will kind of like worship you and then people who don't know you who will despise you. And if you let either one of those two affect you, you're not in a good place. Yeah. Because they don't know you. No. <laughs> but but you know me. And so if you knew me and didn't respect me, that would devastate me. If you knew me and didn't love me, that'd be different. That would be devastating. Yeah. And so that is just a stabilizing thing throughout yeah. the whole process. And 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 I'd say to anyone is no matter how difficult your job is or how, how much you're just like in the grind because you take care of your family. You have to find some ways to find moments and experiences that are fulfilling to you. Mm. And I, you know, I've been going through physical therapy because I had knee surgery and, and uh, I always end up in these therapeutic counseling sessions with whoever's training me. So my, <laughs> you were giving them the thing. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, so this past week, my, uh, my PT guy goes, I don't know what's wrong with me. I'm just so driven to make money. I just know it's greed, but it's never enough. It's never enough. It's never enough. And then I told him, I said, you need to stop living your life for money and live it for freedom. Mm. And uh, he goes, well, what do you mean? I said, because if you're, if you're driven by money, you're going to come down to your life, realize you've abdicated all your freedom. Mm. But if you, if you realize money is just a vehicle that allows you to be free to live the life you long to live, then money will be a tool. It will not be your master. And and I said, I, I like I've lived my life to be fully free. Rise inside going, but I'm gonna make that money though. <laughs> no, I'm listening. <laughs> and uh, no, and because there, there's a certain break point where there are people who have great wealth, but they're not free. No. 
They yeah. just they just have to have more and more and more, and so they're, they're not stuck. free. Then there are people who who are in poverty, and they have a, a incredible level of freedom because they've learned how to live their life with great joy and celebration. And there is a break point. I think every you know I think studies show that you need to make about seventy five thousand dollars a year in the United States to be able to pay your basic bills in a in a meaningful, reasonable way. But then they found that happiness doesn't increase after that. What's crazy is that happiness actually does increase up to seventy five thousand because you can eat. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Because you're able to provide yeah. you provide for your Same family. You can have, we'll do the whole thing. You, you yeah. know, some small niceties like air conditioning or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, or yeah. fresh milk. Or like and, a second car or, or even just having a car. A car, yeah. Like that. yeah. But there's a certain point after at seventy five thousand where happiness is not um, related to money, but it's about freedom, about your sense of significance, your dignity. Uh, you're, you're doing something meaningful in your life. Yeah. And that's so. I mean, I, I I want both of you to make a great deal of money so you can be really generous. So and uh, so you can give a great deal of money away. Which what? Tell them the story, the billion dollar story. If you were a billionaire. I don't know that story. You remember the story? You uh, asked Mariah. Oh, I, I, Wait, I want to oh. I want to say something first. <laughs> okay. Wait, what is that? No okay. I, it's a really it. sweet I story. I remember um, the first check you ever got for writing a book. Mm -hmm. I remember it's maybe like I have a terrible memory. I have, I think, one of the worst memories ever. But it's probably like one of my most vivid memories ever. Mm. And we were at our house that I grew up in, that we grew up in. We were in the living room. And I remember you opening the envelope and it being like this huge thing because it was the first time that you'd ever gotten paid for writing something, which you mm -hmm. loved doing. That was one of the things that you felt like you had to do that actually brought you joy. Yeah. And um, I remember we needed that money. Yeah, so much. Like we um, didn't have that money to give. That that money was more than my like annual salary. Yeah, and I remember like, you and know. it wasn't a lot. No, it, it was like not now a lot. In hindsight, it was like, like 20, $25,000 something right, like that. Right, like, yeah. like, you know, you, yeah, yeah. It was and, a whole year's income for me. And I remember like, you know, you don't think that your kid's here, but we know we knew that there were things that we couldn't afford, that we mm -hmm. we knew that we couldn't buy any, you know, extra. It was just for food. It was just for like putting a roof over our heads. And I remember that first check and that being such a huge deal and we were all celebrating. And then I remember that you told us that we were going to give all of that money to the church. Which if you're listening to this and you don't go to church, that you're going to be very confused right now. <laughs> well, I think even if you do go to church, you're going to be very confused. And if you do go to church, you're confused. also going to be very confused. Um, because I'd never, you know, we knew that you were generous because there were always people living at our house. There were always, you know, there was always furniture leaving. There was always like <laughs> things being given and there were always people being brought in and fed and loved on, on and cared for. There was somehow um, always enough. But I'd never experienced that like you know, at least in my like, what, six year old brain, I'm like, well, it seems like what, you know, mom and dad are saying is that we don't have money to do anything and there's money. So why wouldn't we just keep the money? <laughs> <laughs> why wouldn't that money just be like the solution to something? Right. And even just being a part of that decision to, to, you know, celebrate that you had made money from something you love doing and then to celebrate that that, that money was God's and not our money was I think a huge mentality shift for us. And I, you know, I'm yeah, not sure that wow. I understood it because the other checks that came in, it was the same story. And, you know, <laughs> and on our end, we still were in need in, in certain ways, you know? And so I just thought that that was for you always being more generous, you know, that and that was, that's yeah. the thing that increased the happiness or the, the joy for yeah. you was like, yeah, let me get it. It doesn't live. It's not mine to keep. Yeah, and I, I still remember that moment. I still remember uh, you asking to hold the check. <laughs> and, uh, and, so I've uh, always wanted money. <laughs> and uh, and, uh, and uh, you actually caressed the check. Oh my gosh! <laughs> and and, uh, and and then I remember the shocking, uh, the look of shock on your face when I said we're going to give it all to the church, and and having a really important family conversation about why, mm -hmm. and and. And for me, there's twofold. One was that uh, Kim and I had committed that money before I ever made it. Mm. And because we wanted to be generous beyond our capacity and yeah. that made me more generative. And I think sometimes we think, oh, I'll be gener generous after I'm generative. But actually I think when you choose to be generous, it compels you to be generative. Yeah. And But I think the second side of it is, 
I wanted to give that money as a declaration of this is not all the money I'm ever going to make. This yeah. is just the beginning of of all the possibilities that are out there for us. And yeah. you know, I never wanted to live as if we were limited. I wanted to live as if we had an abundance. But for there's sure. funny, when you were a little girl, we were driving, I think San Diego actually, and we began having a conversation. We were eating at a Thai restaurant in San Diego, you and me, Mariah. Okay. And I said, Mariah, if, um, if I gave you a billion dollars, what would you do with it? This is the story. You don't remember this? And, Maybe we'll and see you, what happens. You, <laughs> we might have blocked it out. And you said, I would give it all away to the homeless and, and to the poor. And I said, um, that's a beautiful thing, darling. But, oh, I if do you, remember this. but if you give it all away, mm -hmm. then you will be homeless and poor. <laughs> <laughs> and someone will have to take care of you. She goes, what? But, but, but if I have a million, billion dollars, I want to give it all away. I said, Mariah, it would be better for you to invest that billion dollars so that billion dollars could make $5 billion so that you could give away not just $8 billion, but you could give away $2 billion and then keep $3 billion. So you're trying or, to teach me about the econo economics. Econ econ <laughs> economics. Economic. And you started crying in the restaurant and going, why won't you let me give away a billion dollars? <laughs> <laughs> that was always that was always you. And, and I had to find it's okay, honey. It's you okay. Too. Away, you you can, can give away the whole billion. I'll take care of How you. old was I? You're probably eight years old. You were young. I, I, I don't think <laughs> I was. Teach me about was I, there? I don't think so. No. I, I was just trying to teach you that um the resources you have can are limited if you don't think in terms of how you can optimize them. Mm -hmm. And it, and if you have a billion dollars. Think about how to make 10 billion so you can give 8 billion away. So you can keep the 2 billion to make another 9 billion. If you give the whole billion away, then you're in the same situation as everyone else. I realized it was not a conversation that you wanted to have. No, you, wanted to, you wanted to give your billion dollars away <laughs> well, and I was trying to stop you. <laughs> I think it's funny that you're saying that, that that money that you got from your book, that you had already committed it because yes. I was in that same situation maybe two years ago when we had you know, a chance to commit something mm -hmm. in the future to mm -hmm. Mosaic, to church. Yeah. And I had written down a number and Jake and I talked about it and it was like, okay, this is the number. We have money coming in and it's going to be more than this. So this will, you know, it was obviously mm -hmm. an uncomfortable number, but we were like, okay, we're going we're gonna to get more than this. So it's not a big deal. Turns out we got exactly <laughs> that amount. That amount. <laughs> and we were both like, this is super awkward because. <laughs> <laughs> you thought you were going to get more. We thought we were going to get more, and we didn't. But and that number, as a third-party witness to the situation, it was a very large number. Yeah, I mean, for definitely for us. And no, well, for you, me. You, you, you and Jake <laughs> were one of the biggest givers in our entire church. Yes. And, you, and, and that, that was, was, the, that that was, was, was that here to stay? It was, it was a foundation yeah. Sunday. It was like a, it was a big... Yeah. And, you and that was the first there. like significant mm -hmm. amount of money either of us had ever received. And um, so knowing how... Um, uncomfortable I was in that moment to be like, okay, I, I literally told God that I'm giving this to him. But you didn't know it was going to be a hundred percent. I didn't know it was going to be a hundred percent. I thought like in the Thai restaurant, I was going to have some left. <laughs> I thought I was going to be able to apply those principles. Um, but even for you all those years before to have given everything, you know, to be like, okay, I've already committed this and now I have it. It, I mean, it had to hurt a little bit to be like, I could use this money, I need this money, but I've committed this money. And so it, it just goes to show that like being in that position in my adult life, yeah. it couldn't have been easy for you to to decide that that was God's, you know? Right. And, no, it, it's a good hurt. Like it does hurt. Yeah. And you know the good that you're doing. Yeah, and it's so it's super not easy. Not that I've given nearly as much as either one of you have, but... It, but as but but I'm as a witness, it's 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 convicting. Going wow, yeah. these two people who've given massive faith, and and I think anyone who's listening, going away, they're talking about a lot about money. One, if you read about talking about money, you do you think about it a lot. So why not talk about it? <laughs> and, and I will say, you're this, living your whole life yeah. probably to make money. So good conversation. To and, have. and my best friends that are generous, we all talk about money. 
Mm-hmm. And we all, and when we were really poor, we all talked about being successful. And now that we're a little bit more successful than we were, we talk about the next level of success we're going to achieve. Mm-hmm. And we hold each other accountable for those things. I think it, talking about money and talking about yeah. generosity is super important to relationships. It, it is interesting that we're doing a podcast that's a family podcast. Yeah. And you can't really talk about our family without talking about the way we think about responsibility and stewardship and money. And, and, and sacrifice. Yeah. And if anything, to me, it's sacrifice and being a provider mm-hmm. is the thing you've always talked to us about is like, do not ever be limited by the current situation that you are in. Yeah. Know that, that one, that God has so much for you in the future, yeah. but two, like be ruthless and relentless and kind and peaceful, but achieve and keep pushing. And if it, you lose everything in the process, you can start over. Yeah. yeah. You know, you taught us like a, if there's a, a, a timeline or like a structure of the way that your life is supposed to go, that being, you know, born or alive teaches you mm-hmm. or being in the United States teaches you, you've taught us to defy all of those things. Mm. You've, you've taught us that there's no such thing as retirement, <laughs> really, <laughs> you know, and you've taught us to um, make money because you want us to be generous. Yes. You've taught us that like everything that society wants to teach us is um, not necessarily what God is teaching us or what we can actually, um, like the, that's not the height of what we can experience in, as a human in this life. Mm-hmm. That there's more, that there's greater, that there's more you know, satisfaction, that mm-hmm. there's more passion to be had, there's more adventure to seek, there's more places to see, there's more um, human beings to know. You know, there's there's greater depth to this life than what, anyone could ever teach us and I think that's probably the best thing you've ever taught us is that and and probably the hardest thing that we've ever had to like grapple with in our life is that um you've called us to such a higher standard of existence that it gets hard to even exist because (laughs) there's this whole other realm of humanity that has been revealed to us by just being your children oh it's, it's hard to live normal after being your child and to now being your adult <laughs> 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 but 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 i say that and i and i you know, we adult. talk about generosity we talk about being a provider but really i think the thing i got an email this week on our bad ready podcast thing and and the person said you know i'm just a waiter mm, I, I was a waiter and i and i was a dishwasher <laughs> you didn't make it the waiter i didn't even make it to waiter. they hired me on the like you're going to be a waiter bartender and first night it was you're going to be a dishwasher <laughs> and and i would go for my really which was ironic because i'd go for my really like, glamorous job working at like a fashion company dressing really cool to then having my backpack full of like the just the normal like the normal clothes and getting stuff all over my uniform and like dishwashing every night from like you know mm-hmm. when i left the other job to like three in the morning and you taught us that nothing is beneath us. That whether you're cleaning the bathroom mm-hmm. or, or on the platform, you're never going to stop cleaning the bathroom. That there's this yeah. thing about you that you're, you, you teach us humility in a way. And I think I lack humility in a lot of moments. I'm looking to Mariah. I lack humility <laughs> in a lot of moments. But you've taught us this thing that nothing's beneath you. And I think maybe if anything that I've learned is that like because nothing's beneath us when it comes to work, when it mm-hmm. comes to drive, when it comes to like how do you achieve, something it, it takes a lot of the awkwardness away the embarrassment of like well i lost this thing like no i'm proud that we had nothing because it, it we have the roadmap to being successful again and again and you could have been so much more successful if you had been willing to throw a few more amens hallelujahs and <laughs> and and spoke to christians the way christians want to be spoken to not the way that you feel like god called you to speak to people mm-hmm. right and and that's always been the thing you sit down with us what, what are you laughing at it's just true. It's, it's just very funny. true. It's very true. And you face the same things. You know, you could probably do some things differently and top the charts in the Christian world, but you have no interest. You have the interest of, of creating amazing music that's going to challenge people. No, she has this tension. She wants she to top the charts on her own terms. <laughs> <laughs> well, isn't that what you Definitely. taught us? It is what I taught you. Everything on your own terms. Uh, strive for greatness, <laughs> never conform to the standards of others. But that's the thing is that you... And wait, but hold on. Mm-hmm. I just want to... No, because cause if the person listening and they're cynical and they're like, well, what do they mean that they're, they're just not acting like everybody else? Like, no, no. There is literally a roadmap when you sign a book deal, when you sign a record deal, when you, when you sign a podcast thing that shows you how to be successful with Christians. Mm-hmm. They say, 
They don't want complex. They don't want intellectual. They don't want deep. They want easy, simple, Actually, the phrase encouraging, is low hand, low hanging fruit. Yes. So if you're uh, listening, yeah. if you're listening, they think you're the low hanging fruit, and we refuse to accept that for you. Yeah, and for us, like we you refuse because we refuse to accept yeah. it for ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. We're gonna get in a lot. Yeah, of I trouble. remember sitting down with my agents, so <laughs> my former agents, and they flew out to my house and and they said, "Hey, if you want to be a, a bestseller, if you want to sell millions of books in the Christian world, you got to write low hanging fruit, and your books are just never going to." So like that. And and it's, you know, and they go, here, here's the subject you got. If you write on prayer, relationships, like faith, it, you know, there are like code words. And if you write those, you're going to sell a lot of books. And, and and not that those subjects aren't important. They're just not the oh, things are. that I feel compelled to write about. Yeah. And, There's never been a um, a need for any of us to, like, be successful with a certain group of people. No. And no. I think that that's been the, like... I've tried. <laughs> I know you have. And that's hard because you want, you want, you want the acceptance. I do, I do. And um, we seem to refuse to help yep. you get, get it. Um, sure. But... I'm, I'm the bridge that no one wants to drive on. Because <laughs> <laughs> we just keep lighting the bridge on fire. But, you yeah. know, someone asked me when I was your age, uh, maybe just a little bit older, um, how are you able to not care what people think of you? And I said, oh, you completely misunderstand me. I care so much. <laughs> <laughs> and I, oh, I, no. I said, you're looking objectively at my choices and you think I don't care. That's oh, yeah. how bad I am at it. <laughs> because I, I wanted to be accepted uh. so badly, it hurt. And I just couldn't compromise my inner compass and but i i wanted to say imagine how bad it would be if i didn't want to be accepted well, yeah the, can you imagine <laughs> I, I really did i just couldn't you i couldn't get myself to do what was needed to be accepted that easily okay wait mariah you can speak to this there's always a moment in one of dad's messages where we know he's gonna offend everyone in the room yeah like when we're out like well, in mosaic they're pretty used to it because there are people, they're home, yeah. and a lot of guests always, but like who just kind of walk in, but but they kind of get it, they get they get how it is. But when we go to like a Christian conference, or we go to like even a sec like a mainstream, yeah, world, we stopped doing that. We couldn't we couldn't handle it anymore. What being in the room when he speaks? <laughs> yeah, like at certain yeah, yeah. places. Yeah, because I mean, there's been there's been rooms where I'm like, we got to go now. <laughs> <laughs> we're not gonna make it. Yeah, out. sometimes Mariah, you come and said. I want to come in there because I know it's going to be controversial. I used to it's love like, it. No, I think it's, There's been moments where I'm like, do we not like having friends? I think as we've gotten older and um, we've like be, like started to like people. Like I think yes, when we, we were younger, yes. it was so clear that there was like a difference. And we were yeah. so clearly like, okay, we 100% are like behind you know, our dad and we're a hundred percent like behind his thinking and behind his method and behind his crazy. You are. And, <laughs> and, we are now. We are, we are, we are. No, but then there was a, there was like, for the first time, there were so many people that we actually liked yes. that were becoming yes. Yes. pastors or that were, mm -hmm. we, that were surrounding us. Yes. And especially that were like more your age that were like, yeah, you know, yeah. that you were looking up to, that you really cared about, that you cared about, um, us being friends with, and I think that it was really important, an important shift. I think it was important for you to learn how to play nice and, um, <laughs> no, but those for guys, you to, yeah, 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 but, yeah. But I'm just saying, like, I think that there was a shift for us. Like, there are certain rooms that you walk into, I'm like, offend everyone, and then let's, and then let's like run in a car and get out here and not <laughs> check that. Instagram or check mm -hmm. anything. Like, yeah. let's just, let's just drop the bombs and go. Mm -hmm. But there are certain places that I think it's mattered, like, Okay, the, maybe the method could change just a hair to keep our lives just a little bit. Yeah. Well, maybe there might be a little bit of like, <laughs> <laughs> might have been a little bit like post-traumatic stress disorder where I was so used to fighting for so many years that suddenly a generation began to emerge that embraced fighting, our message yeah. and loved mosaic and loved the message was, of of uh, of Jesus the way we're communicating it, and suddenly we realized, oh, we don't have to fight anymore. They're actually they're yeah. actually cheering us on. They're actually jumping totally. and, on the tribe and moving I, forward with us. Because we're so different. Totally. But you can generally be creative and be different and think different and be with us and be in our tribe and be in our family. And family doesn't have to all look the same. Yeah. And, totally. and ironically, we don't need people to agree with us. We, 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 uh, we <laughs> love 
I want some. <laughs> I want some people to agree with us. No, I, I think you can actually like walk together and be on the same team and love each other and fight for good together and still like disagree about different stuff. Totally. You, you know, I think that's that that's a part of the I think the uniqueness of mosaic. Yes. This is the uniqueness <laughs> of mosaic. And this is I have the story to top it off. Okay. I got connected to someone by one of our other friends, one of our mutual friends that we met in Colorado, randomly in a coffee shop. Yes. He owns a really cool company, started a really cool company. And he was telling this person I didn't know, I was like, how do you know him? And and they were like, well, we were talking about church because I had a cross around my neck. And he goes, oh, if you go to church, you have to go to Mosaic. Oh. And, and, and she was like, no, no, I already have a church. He's like, yeah, but it's not Mosaic. <laughs> And he, he's also not religious. He's an, I think he's an atheist. And, and, and also like born in Italy, the coolest guy, born in Italy from the Middle East, you know, left Iran and, and now is in the US and live in LA and the whole family and the whole thing. And they back Mosaic so much harder than I think we would even. And, and she was like, no, no, you don't understand. Not like Mosaic. <laughs> and he was like so persistent and like maybe slightly offensive on our behalf. And it was just super cool. And I think that's the thing is like, we don't do it for like the popular love. We do it for that guy who's like, maybe he'd never accept Jesus in his life. I believe he will, but he would have never come to church if we weren't super different mm. in our ideology and our thinking and, and the way that you have built this community and built this tribe and built just the way you think. And I'm yeah. grateful. Totally. The reputation of Jesus is very different because of you. And even just like the, we were laughing about this the other day because like LAFC, is obsessed with you and like yes, they, they like brought you this like really really special pair of shoes because you are like making a difference in the city right and they love you and we love them obviously yeah and then you know the lakers may have been talking about you on you know the on their, game the, the other day about locker room chat this, the talk that you gave um when kobe, kobe passed yeah. and then the clippers want to send you you know like all the stuff there's all these different things that we love, you know, that we loved before there was any ever any relationship and except for the Lakers, we are starting to love them now. Um, but that that you've changed the reputation of Jesus in the city that people like love you and then they realize that you love Jesus and it's this open door and it's become even just like in the last couple of years of your life, it feels like all those doors are being like kicked down in every relation, open. every relationship yeah. um, in this city and all over the world is being open to you because of your sort of strange and different way of thinking and your and the way that you wanted to say that you were saying that you want to change um, a generation's way of thinking is exactly what's happening mm. because people are starting to to understand and embrace and adopt the way that you that your brain works <laughs> i don't think we could close on a better note so i want to just one again happy birthday we thank love you so happy much birthday, thank Dad. you guys so it has much. been an absolute and incredible honor to have you mariah mcmanus goss on our Ooh. podcast and i hope that you will come on more We'd love sure, to have you let's more. Do it. But but <laughs> I don't. That did not feel sincere. <laughs> no, no. That sounded like it's gonna be hard to get you on here. Uh, no, see. but but I want to say this is that that's what this podcast is. It's a roadmap to how to think, mm -hmm. how to change your thinking, how to challenge your thinking, how to think not just on the left or the right, but to see both sides and to continually move forward. That's what this podcast is. If anything, I hope that a hundred years from now, someone finds this podcast and goes, "This is how Erwin McManus." taught the world how to think in a different way and then had fun on it as well so if you're listening we're grateful that you're listening any last words ah best gift in the world is you two looking at you hearing you knowing how uh, you make makes a difference in the world and uh, we'll have to get your mom in here one day yeah and uh and jake on here as well and yes and I, you know if you're listening um if you're a parent, I just want to encourage you to not use your work as an excuse to not be a great dad or mom. And um, the greatest gift you'll ever receive is to have your kids grow up and actually watch them want to be your friends. And when your kids want to be your friends when they're adults, you can feel like you did a good job. Mm. 
Yeah, even though they're still dysfunctional and neurotic. <laughs> so much a compliment. I'll, go, I'll be the dysfunctional one. You can be the neurotic one. And, um, and, and I think parenting is always an imperfect art because it's only imperfect people doing it. Uh, so it really is about love. And I can say I've loved both of you every second of your lives. Mm -hmm. And um, can't wait to see all that God is going to do in your lives going forward. Um, anyway, thank you so much. This is a great birthday gift for me. And I love you both. Love you both. Love you. <laughs> love you. Hey, guys, thank you so much for checking out this episode of Have Father, Will Travel. Uh, Battle Ready episode back from 2020 during the pandemic, during the quarantine. Just me, my sister, my dad having a sit down chat. Uh, one of those memories that I will never forget and will hold dear to my heart. Uh, if you guys will do this for me, we just wrapped up the Art of Communication 10 week Q&A and it was unreal. We did this two hour session at the very end where we broke down different communicators talks some people were in the class they were pastors some were doctors some were business leaders and we broke down their videos of their talks Austin would put them up on the thing and my dad would just rip them apart it was maybe one of the best things I've ever seen we have to do that with an episode of battle ready where my dad just takes my inability to communicate at times and just rips it apart I think it'd be so fun um but if you haven't checked out the Art of Communication, go and check that out. Uh, and if you haven't checked out our merch, go and check that out. Buy it now. And last but not least, rate and review this podcast. Subscribe to our YouTube page. Uh, like this video. Like this episode. Give us five stars. Let us know where you're watching from, where you're listening from, in the comments or in the rate and review. It means so much to us. Thank you guys and have a great week. I'll see you guys next week.